All right, so we're going to get started. Um, so uh, my name is Jenna, and I'd just like to welcome everyone to the webinar today. Um, and thank you all for taking the time to join um, on a cloudy Monday morning. Um, and thank you to all our, our panelists who have uh, uh, kindly offered their time to, to share their experiences with you today. Um, just a reminder for the panelists on the phone, if, if um, you're not speaking, to please mute your lines, just to cut back on some of the background noise. And for the attendees and participants um, on our webinar today, this uh, slide, hopefully you'll be able to see it. Um, this slide is just uh, uh, to let you know how to connect to us if you're having some audio troubles. Um, so you are welcome to listen through your computer, but the audio is often clearer if you phone in to the line on the screen. Um, so yeah, so please uh, phone in to that line if, if your audio seems choppy coming out of your phone or out of your computer. Um, if you have any questions for the panelists today, I encourage you to please type in the chat box or the question box on your GoToWebinar window um, as we're working through the content, and we will try to answer as many of the questions as we can um, at the end of the webinar today. Um, hopefully, um, we'll be able to get through most of the content by about 1 o'clock, and then uh, we will open it up for discussion. I'll just do a bit of an audio test for our attendees on the um, line. Can you just type in the chat box if you're able to hear hear me talk? Great. Okay. Uh, so it sounds like uh, folks can can hear us, which is great. Um, again, if you have any trouble, please uh, dial into the phone line that you see on the screen. Um, a few more points uh, for housekeeping before we get going. Uh, the first is that on your GoToWebinar control window, you'll have access to the handouts that we're talking about today, uh, including the slide deck. So please uh, feel free to right click on those um, handouts and download for your own use. And um, yeah, this webinar is going to be recorded and you'll get a follow up email this afternoon with much of the content and resources that we're sharing with you today. Um, but just to expect that in your inbox uh, later on this afternoon. And one last uh, item uh, for housekeeping is that the EQIP team is uh, 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 quite active on Twitter uh, in the past few months, and we encourage um, everyone that participates in our training events and our webinars to also tweet out about uh, your learnings and um, your experiences in quality improvement. Um, so please uh, tweet to us um, using the hashtag EquipOn about your experience here today. And um, so today we're here to talk about client and family member engagement. And before we get into the thick of things, um, we just like to uh, define what we mean by client and family engagement. Uh, we do have a, a a very knowledgeable guest on the line with us today from Health Quality Ontario. And there is a bit of a language difference between um, EQIP and the HQO team. So we just want to make sure that we clarify that um, before we get into the content. Um, so when the EQIP team is talking uh, about client and family engagement, those are the, the two terms that we use. When HQO um, is discussing engagement with um, service users, they refer to um, uh, those individuals as patients or caregivers. Um, in the resources that they'll be sharing with you today. Um, so when referring to clients, what we mean is individuals that are receiving a wide range of support from the community mental health and addiction sector. Um, when HQO uses the language of patients, uh, they are describing individuals accessing healthcare services from a broad range of sectors, including mental health and addiction. Family and caregivers, um, from the EHOOK perspective, are individuals identified by clients as part of their recovery journey. Um, and when we're speaking about uh, client engagement today in improvement work, um, we're going to be hearing from um, agencies that have uh, really uh, um, embraced engagement of clients and family members through projects that are looking to improve services um, and programs that they're offering uh, in a really um, uh, problem-based way so they, they understand that there's issues facing clients and how can we engage um, with clients and family members to understand how to actually improve uh, those particular problems um, through their engagement work. So hopefully that's helpful to you. Our goals uh, for participating today are um, for you to discover some resources available for you 
uh, to, to lead quality improvement work and engage clients and family members as you do so. Uh, we're also going to be learning about the value of engagement of clients and family members um, from the health service providers that we're lucky to have on the phone with us today. Um, and they'll really be focusing on some practical steps and actions that they've taken to, um, uh, to engage with their clients and family members, and hopefully you'll be able to um, take away some fairly concrete actions um, um, uh, from this webinar. And finally, we want the opportunity um, to be provided to you to ask questions uh, to folks that have done a really great job at engaging their clients and family members. Um, so please feel free to type your questions in the question box as we work through the webinar. And again, we'll try to get through as many as we can uh, by the end of today. So we'll do introductions uh, and we'll go in order of the, uh, the panelists on the, on the screen here. Um, so I'll, I'll start. My name is uh, Jenna Hitchcock. I am the pro Program Manager for the Excellence Through Quality Improvement Project. Um, and we'll uh, go through, through the panelists here uh, in order. Hi there, I'm Stephanie Legoski and I'm a Knowledge Translation and Exchange Specialist for the Patient and Public Partnering Team at Health Quality Ontario. Hi, um, I'm Tanya Bowman DeMarco. I'm a nurse that works for the CMHA Sault Ste. Marie branch in the supportive housing program. Hi, I'm Brianna Deboski. I work at the CMHA Lambton Kent branch uh, and I primarily work in early intervention as the intake and family therapist. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Azad Pervez, um, working at Mainstay Housing at Quality and Performance Analytics Manager. Uh, and uh, very excited to join everyone here. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. Um, so everyone on the line today um, was identified by the EQIP team as having some really great experience through the work um, that we've, we've done with them on client and family member engagement. So we're, we're really lucky to have all the perspectives included um, today. Um, so just a little bit about EQIP for those on the line that might not be uh, familiar with our uh, initiative. The EQIP team, or the Excellence Through Quality Improvement Project, is a partnership initiative between Addictions and Mental Health Ontario, the Canadian Mental Health Association Ontario Division, and Health Quality Ontario. And we're really here to help promote the use um, and motivation uh, of improvement methods and tools across the community mental health and addiction sector. Um, we know that there's an existing commitment to provide high quality care and person-centered care to clients and families in the sector. Um, we're just uh, here to, to help um, bring those commitments out and provide some frameworks and tools to help agencies do that. Um, we've been around since 2006 um, and we really provide a whole host of offerings uh, across the sector to again um, help people get motivated to do quality improvement work and understand and apply quality improvement methods. We do that in a variety of different ways. Uh, the first is our, our coaching support, uh, which all of the um, three agencies that are on the line today have participated in. We also have an extensive training and education program, which these webinars are a part of. And we also have an online community of practice that serves as a portal for all of our resources, but also for information sharing amongst those doing QI work in the, in the sector that, that we're um, serving. And this is how we define quality improvement um, from the EQIP perspective, but also um, in Ontario, this is how uh, we define it. I won't go through um, this definition as uh, you may read through it, um, but really all this to say is quality improvement is about making um, a continuous effort to improve care and experiences for the people that you're serving, regardless of what setting um, you're working in across the healthcare sector. And so when we're talking about quality improvement, we're really thinking about how can we make um, clients more satisfied and uh, their experiences better, and how can we make sure that the outcomes that they're experiencing after receiving care um, are leading uh, to better health and a better quality of life. And these are the three models that uh, the EQIP team uses to promote quality improvement um, across the community mental health and addiction sector. We'll start on the right-hand side, the quadruple aim. This is really the ultimate goal of um, QI work um, that we support. Um, and it's really about uh, making uh, healthcare outcomes better for the people that we're serving, uh, making sure that we're doing um, that at the lowest cost and being efficient in the way that we're providing care, 
making sure that the providers that are taking care of the clients that are, are in our services and programs um, are satisfied with their job and um, actually finding meaning and um, uh, uh, value in the work that they're doing. Uh, and of course, getting those better healthcare outcomes for the individuals accessing services. So that's really the ultimate goal of quality improvement and the work that we do. The um, middle framework that we use, the domains of quality, are, are pretty globally recognized domains of what make up a high quality healthcare system. And so when we're working on projects or we're promoting and um, talking about quality improvement, we want to be making sure that um, that the, uh, the projects uh, and initiatives that we take on are um, promoting um, equitable care, timely care, client-centered care, efficient care, effective care, and we want to make sure that the care we're providing is safe. And the thought here is that if the projects that you're working on um, touch one of those um, uh, domains uh, that will be leading to those um, kind of uh, those uh, the quadruple aim on the, the left. Um, and so the very last um, uh, model on the left hand side of the screen is the model for improvement. And this is really all about the how. And so um, when we work with the model for improvement, um, there's a set of tools and um, uh, kind of steps that are part of the model for improvement um, that we work through in order to achieve um, those, those uh, domains of healthcare quality and ultimately get us to the quadruple aim of a high quality healthcare system. So I'm going to pass things over um, to Stephanie now as she's going to be uh, sharing some resources that are available from Health Quality Ontario to help you engage with clients and families in improvement work. Thank you, Jenna. Um, all right, if I can go to the next slide here. There we go. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Stephanie, I'm from Health Quality Ontario, and uh, I'm gonna keep my section pretty brief because I think the best resource that all of you have are probably hearing from your peers on the way that you've uh, engaged patients in your work. Um, so I'll start with just a brief overview of Health Quality Ontario. I'm not sure how familiar you are with uh, our organization, uh, but as a refresher, uh, we are the Provincial Advisor on the Quality of Healthcare in Ontario. Um, we help healthcare professionals to be more effective in what they do by providing objective advice and data and by supporting them in improving healthcare for the people of Ontario. And within Health Quality Ontario, we have a patient engagement uh, department, which is where I'm coming from today. We do patient engagement internally through our programs and services and things that we develop at Health Quality Ontario, but we also have an arm of our program that I work within that takes what we know at Health Quality Ontario and patient engagement and spreads that throughout the system help build capacity and other people to do it. So to start our patient engagement journey, and this is the first resource I'll be sharing with you today, um, it's our uh, patient engagement framework. And uh, we provide we developed this to help guide our work internally and provide guidance for those who wanted to do patient engagement in the system. And we see different ways that you might be able to use uh, this framework in your work. Uh, the first way you can use it is to just learn about the principles and practices and opportunities to engage if you are newer to patient engagement. Um, you can also use this framework to assess your organization's engagement activities. And you could also plan patient engagement activities using this framework in a more purposeful and integrated way to support the positive impact of engagement on the quality of care programs, services, and interactions. So I'll just do a brief overview of the different parts of this framework. Um, at the top, we have a strategic goal, and it recognizes that we're not just engaging for the sake of engagement, but we're doing it to drive high quality healthcare. Underneath that, we have some guiding principles that uh, we believe make engagement meaningful, including partnership, learning, transparency, and responsiveness. Below that, uh, we outline the different domains that you might be doing patient engagement in and recognize that there is value to doing patient engagement across all domains of care from personal care and health decisions to a step up from that, so program and service design, all the way up to policy, strategy, and governance. 
Below that, uh, we outline that there are a spectrum of engagement approaches that you might um, engage in. So sharing health information is just as uh, much of an engagement approach as consulting with uh, patients and caregivers or deliberating in a more involved approach, all the way up to collaborating and partnering to address an issue and apply solutions. And the last part of this framework at the bottom are uh, some key enablers that are, if they are in place, you can, um, you're more likely to have successful engagement, uh, including a culture of quality improvement, a commitment to health equity and cultural competence, and continuous learning through research and evaluation. And we have this framework as well as a um, guide that can help you use this framework on our tools and resource hub. Speaking of our tools and resource hub, um, we have one <laughs> on our website. And it's, uh, it's a carefully curated and we regularly update this hub um, of tools and resources to support patient engagement. And we gather these tools and resources from not only across Ontario and Canada, but from across the world as well. And within this site, we've broken it down into two areas to make it easier for our users to decide which resources might be useful to them. We have a side of our resource hub for patients, families, and caregivers. And we have a side of our hub for healthcare providers. And underneath each of those sections, uh, you can search our resources by topics. So some of the topics that we have are getting started with patient engagement, evaluating your patient engagement activities, or building equity and diversity into your activities. So I've put the link up here and I invite you all to browse our site. So here are some specific examples of some tools and resources that might be useful to you um, in your patient engagement work. We have a guide up at the, uh, the top corner about engaging with patients and caregivers specifically in quality improvement, and that's a guide meant for healthcare providers. Below that, um, if you're engaging with patients and caregivers or clients through the method of having an advisory council, we created a set of um, four guides that can help you do some pretty pivotal parts of advisory council work, and this one's an example of how to create an effective terms of reference. Above that in the corner, we have a series of one pagers that are very quick takeaway guides that help you build capacity in some practical aspects of patient engagement. Uh, for example, one of these uh, checklists is um, a list of common acronyms that we use in healthcare that can be used uh, for the advisors that you work with to help make them for more familiar about the language that we use. And then at the bottom corner, we have our insights paper on the patient engagement trends that we see in the quality improvement plans that are submitted to us. So here are some key examples of what you might find. They're all available on our resource hub. Next um, is our quorum, spotlight stories and quorum. So we try to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer information sharing as well, in addition to sort of channeling what we're doing at HQO and sharing it out. So here is our uh, quality improvement, uh, online quality improvement community called Quorum. And on there, you can find um, specific stories and blog posts from organizations across the province who are already doing patient engagement. And these stories are really great because what they do is they talk about exactly what they've done and why they did it. They talk about the effects that they're seeing from their patient engagement strategies. And they give very tangible, easy to implement tips on how you could do what they're doing, um, should you wish to do the same type of programs or activities. So on the screen right now, I've highlighted three, um, three key stories that we have on Quorum. One is about engaging patients in supporting safe medication administration. The other one is using TeachBack to reduce unnecessary returns to the emergency department. And another one is understanding the unique care elements for patients with mental health conditions. So I also invite you already, if you haven't done so, to log into Quorum and to take a look around and see who's out there doing what patient engagement work and who you might want to connect to. And last but not least, um, we recognize that you might have some more specific questions about patient and caregiver engagement and might need a little bit more personalized uh, assistance. So we're always happy to answer any questions you have via email or set up a time to chat as well. And I've put the uh, email on the screen here with how you can reach us. And uh, that basically covers the spectrum of some of the resources and supports that we provide um, to the healthcare system with regards to patient engagement. And I'm always happy to answer any questions you might have at the end of this presentation. Great, thanks so much, Stephanie.
And um, we'll uh, put up some additional contact information to uh, reach Stephanie directly at the end of the webinar. Um, but those are some really great resources um, that the EQIP team uh, often taps into when we're talking about uh, client and family member engagement in our work. Um, so please check those out. Uh, the framework is also included in the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel, um, and I encourage you to download um, that document. Um, uh, before I move on, I would just like to ask that if uh, you're participating today um, uh, from an agency to let us know where you're um, uh, phoning and joining this from uh, in the chat box, as well as if there's more than one uh, individual uh, with you on the phone, if you could uh, let us know how many people are watching the webinar. Um, that just helps keep uh, an eye on uh, how our EQIP webinars are doing in terms of reach. Um, so if you could take a minute just to do that now, that would be incredibly helpful for us. And so we're going to talk a little bit about some of the trends that we've seen uh, from the community mental health and addiction sector in terms of how we're doing on engagement work, particularly in quality improvement initiatives. Um, and I encourage you to reflect on uh, where your organization or agency falls uh, within some of these questions um, that will be uh, coming up. So we did a survey in 2017 across um, the sector and asked uh, participants of the survey to let us know um, their degree of client and family member engagement within QI projects and initiatives. And this is what we heard from the sector. So um, we heard that about 29% of agencies do include clients in the planning or um, delivery of QI projects. About 29% of uh, participants do not include client and family members at this point in time. 41% um, somewhat include uh, client and family member engagement, so perhaps there's some uh, work and improvement that can happen there to, to engage uh, in, a, in a better and more comprehensive way. And about 1.5% of the respondents indicated that they were unsure if they engaged with clients in their QI work. So all this to say, um, you know, this is definitely not a, a full representation of the sector as we had about 65 people respond. Um, but we do know that there is some good work happening and there's definitely lots of room for us to improve as a sector um, with regards to including and engaging and collaborating with clients and family members in quality improvement work. The second related question that came out of that survey was about how do you actually let your stakeholders know about the QI efforts that you're doing? Um, and with respect to this webinar and the topic that we're discussing today, uh, we learned that about 50%, uh, a little bit under, um, engage and let the, the clients know about the QI efforts that they're working on. And so um, we can actually learn a lot from, from that stat and that, um, as Stephanie said, you know, sharing information and being transparent with the people that you're serving is incredibly important and a big step of client engagement, particularly if you're trying to improve the care that they're receiving. Um, so just, uh, just all that to say that there's some work that we can do to make sure that the improvement work we are doing is well communicated um, to the people that we're serving so that they can know about the improvements that we're making. So I'm going to open up a poll, and the poll is about the first question um, that we asked in the survey related to client and family member engagement. And we're going to ask you to uh, let us know if there are clients and family members currently involved in the QI work that you're leading or you're a part of. So if you could vote, I'll give you a few minutes to do that. So I'm going to close the poll now, and I'll share the results with you. And so what we can see is uh, that uh, about 50% of you that have joined us today are including clients and family members in the work that you're doing relating to QI, and the other half are somewhat um, engaging with clients and family members involved with QI. Um, so that's great. That's good information to know as we move into our panel discussion. It's nice to see that there's nobody that has selected no. Um, and so uh, I encourage, for those of you that are uh, 
doing client and family member engagement in your QI work uh, to listen to, to some of the actions and strategies that come out today and uh, reflect on some of what you can take forward with you in your organization to enhance your engagement work. And for those that are somewhat um, including clients and family members in your QI, um, to really think about um, some of the, uh, the actions and, and strategies that are coming out, um, again, to help you improve how you're, uh, you're engaging in QI work. So uh, we're going to move into the exciting part of the webinar today. Um, and so first off, we're going to hear from all of the three panelists that have kindly offered their time and joined us today. Um, they're going to be sharing uh, just a little bit about the work that they've done with the EQIP team to give you some of the background context. Um, and then we'll move into some discussion questions on how they have engaged with clients and family members um, on the, the projects that you'll be hearing about uh, very shortly. So we'll first hear from Brianna, who will talk about uh, the work at CMHA Lambton Kent. Yeah, so we had worked with EQIP um, during our time on really helping us solidify our client and family advisory panel, which is something that we've been able to set up both for um, both main sites. So having a client and family advisory panel specific to our Sarnia site, as well as having one that's specific to our Chatham site. Uh, we meet quarterly to be able to take a look at things that are going on in the agency, whether it be quality events, um, whether it be a big chunk of the work that recently the panel has been helping us with was with our accreditation cycle um, and taking a look at being able to be involved in anything from direct involvement and reporting back from service delivery um, to quality projects to being involved in program reviews. Um, they've helped us in terms of having some focus groups and giving us feedback for specific ad hoc uh, things that have come up uh, amongst the agency, but really trying to solidify a new um, type of communication to make sure that what we're providing is very collaborative with the clients and family members that access our services daily. Great, thank you so much. And uh, Tanya from CMHSU St. Marie. Hi, uh, thank you for having me today. So here in the Sault Ste. Marie um, CMHA, we were looking at um, goal planning basically was our, was our bottom line was we have several different tools that we are using right now to um, complete goal planning with our clients. And because of this, it's um, preventing effective communication between the programs that share clients. So you can see the, the numbers there, and uh, some of the evidence was really hard to, we weren't able to obtain all the data basically because um, some of it is just documented um, in an informal way. So our goal is to have a shared goal plan that is accessible to all the staff of CMHA um, and to the clients that we serve. So as well as anybody um, who has come forward as a, an advocate or um, that the client has recognized as somebody they would like involved. So that is what we are currently working on is, um, is goal planning, but it's actually a lot bigger than we anticipated it to be. So it's taking us quite some time to get where we need to go, but that's what we're currently working on. Great, thanks so much, Tanya. And we'll pass things over to Azad. We'll talk about Wednesday, my project. Thank you, Jenna. Uh, so we started working uh, in this project early this year. When we submitted the proposal, we thought, you know, what are the projects that we'll be working on? So, uh, in fact, this project we have been working for quite quite a while, for the last uh, couple of years or so. But uh, we, we have seen that uh, there have not been enough improvements in terms of engagement in, in, in goal coaching. So uh, goal coaching, by we mean by uh, supportive housing workers uh, at Mainstay. They work with tenant members in one-on-one -on -one goal coaching related to housing stability. So uh, that has uh, not been improved in terms of uh, you know tenant engagement. So we started working on that project, and we uh, we were supported by Equip throughout the project. And the aim that we targeted at that point, uh, you know, we have revised the aim statement though, you know, in in uh, you know through the 
uh, through the work that we did with Equip. So with the, we have targeted to increase uh, the tenant participation uh, to 20% of our general program. You know, the data shows which were less than 10%. Uh, so we wanted to increase by 10% uh, by by March 31st, 2019. We are still working on this. Uh, we haven't finished this, even though the project is completed, but we are working on our own uh, and uh, we are supported by Equip, uh, you know, when we need that as well. So, um, yeah, and we are excited to share our stories. Uh, you know, yeah, thank you. Perfect, thanks so much. So um, we've invited the, the panelists just to give a little bit of background on the project so that you're able to um, hear a little bit of that context and, and what projects they're actually working on before we move into the questions. If you're interested on hearing more about the project um, as a whole, we have included a link to the report back presentations that were provided um, by each of the individuals on the phone, but also many of their, their uh, colleagues and QIT members were part of those presentations. Uh, so again, if you're interested in learning more about any of those um, three projects, uh, please listen to the report back presentation. Uh, but we're going to get into what we're here to talk about today, um, client and family member engagement in QI. And so we'll move right into uh, the discussion. And again, if you have any specific questions for the panelists, please feel free to type them in as we're going and we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end of the webinar. So the first uh, questions are related to ways to engage. Um, and so how did you engage clients and family members in your QI project or initiative? Um, and perhaps we'll start with Brianna. Yeah, so a lot of what we started with uh, here at CMJ Lambton Kent, uh, we primarily started with a focus group. So we gathered a handful of family members and clients who were willing to kind of sit down and meet with us. Uh, and we talked with them about some of the ideas that we had kind of going forward in terms of creating something like a panel to be able to give feedback um, and also have that kind of collaborative approach in being able to work um, with the people who we directly serve. So we started from there. Um, and then from that point, it was working with staff and management to really get a buy-in from the agency um, to really help us starting our recruitment in terms of looking for people who would be interested uh, and also people who would be a good fit for what we were hoping to create. So we really truly did start right from the grassroots and connecting with the people who receive our services um, and trying to get them involved in what they would like to see um, or if they thought our approach of how we should start this was something that was realistic and something that they would find helpful. Thank you. Um, and Tanya? Yes, so um, initially we did a client experience survey with clients from both programs that we were, uh, we've decided to focus on, which would be our clubhouse program and our housing program. The results were undefined as the questions that we had were too vague um, and so we were not able to use those answers. However, that led us to developing an experience-based co-design questionnaire with our EQIP experts, coaches, and our team, this allowed us to sit with the clients and the one family member who was present. And uh, we went through the questions. There were eight, um, ex uh, sorry, there were eight questionnaires done. And the, the results were really positive and the clients were really happy to be a part of the, uh, the process. They really felt like they were being valued. Um, Another way that we involved the clients was using the process map as a diagnostic tool, which we then posted in an area accessible to clients. Um, we had staff sit with uh, any clients who expressed interest and explained, you know, what they were looking at, and we were able to get answers from them in regards to, or input from them in regards to the uh, goal planning that we currently use. So that was also very helpful. Great, and before we uh, get to Azad, there is a question for you, Tanya. What is the name of the clubhouse that you're working with? It's called Hope House Club 84. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and I'll pass things over to Azad to talk about um, how Mainstay um, approached and en engaged with clients and, and family members. Okay, so uh, before going to um, you know, how we engage clients for this project, uh, you know, I can talk a little more about, you know, what's the culture uh, here at Mainstay, you know, 
uh, in, in regarding talent engagement. So, um, you know, if, if we see how we engage talents is uh, starting from the board of directors, we have 30% uh, uh, of our 10 members, you know, 30% 30, 30 of our board members are, are in fact our 10 members. So uh, is, is the engagement is top uh, there. Uh, the committees are different working groups that we work at Mainstay, we have representation of 10 members. Uh, in addition to that, we reach out to 10 members whenever we are doing or taking any projects. We, we go for a surveying talents. Uh, you know, one of the surveys that I can talk about is community and belonging survey, where we received a 43% respondent uh, responses uh, back in 2016. So uh, in fact, that survey uh, contributed a great deal in in influencing or designing our QI plan and our and our strategic plan for the recent years. Uh, we have a quality committee, which is a subcommittee of the board of board members, and uh, ten members is also there. So this is how we engage talents at Mainstay in different levels uh, at, at the organization. For this project, our Q, uh, QI project, uh, as I said, the quality committee. But again, we have a QI team, which are more of operational. So we have a talent team members. Um, in fact, we, we targeted about 30% engagement here as well. Uh, you know, 30%, you know, I should say representation of 10 members. We have a team of nine individuals. So we had uh, started off with uh, three talent members in that team. Uh, so this is how we, uh, you know, started off. And then the tools that we used, uh, EBD, first of all, of experience-based co-design, we used a focus group discussion to hear from, from our 10 members. And uh, we also conducted some interviews where we learned one-on-one -on -one, one from 10 members. Uh, in addition to that, whenever we had taking you know or implementing anything we do pdsa cycles where we reach out to 10 members to gather their feedback so this is how we engage as well um, yeah so uh, through through these these different methods we we engage our tenants great thanks and we do have a question for you azad um, uh, the question is regarding the composition of your board um, is that that you have 30% have lived experience or are currently involved with Mainstay? 30% are current tenant members, you know, who are current tenants at Mainstay. Great, thank you. Um, I had a bit of a follow-up question for Brianna, and uh, apologies if you're going to touch on this later, but um, uh, while I was uh, re-watching your, your report back, um, uh, session, I, I did uh, find it of interest that um, for those that aren't part of the panel, you do have um, kind of more of an advisor role that isn't necessarily an ongoing commitment for clients. Would you mind speaking a little bit about that? Yeah, so during, uh, which I'll talk a little bit when we get to recruitment, but when we were recruiting, we definitely found um, there were people who really wanted to be a part of whether it be quality, quality initiatives or random projects uh, around our agency, but not always were they uh, a positive fit in terms of everything that we were looking specifically for a panel member, in terms of maybe you know having a lot on their plate um, or just not being able to kind of fulfill some of the uh, roles that we were looking for. So we recruit for two specific things. So one, we have the panel members who sit on the board. They're there for a term of two years. It's a little bit more formal. Um, but for those clients or family members who do want to be engaged, we do have kind of the role of an advisor. So those are people who are interested in partaking in events and they kind of work on an ad hoc basis. So we do have a list of people that are still engaged in quality initiatives that are kind of one-offs um, just to make sure that it if we do have you know clients and family members who want to be a part of something but don't have the time commitment or just really can't um, be invo involved in something more formal they still have the option to do something on a more short-term basis great thanks so much okay that provides a nice segue into the, the next set of questions um, so uh, we're interested in learning about what are some of the recruitment and orientation strategies for clients and family members to participate in improvement projects um, and the second part to that question is for those um, on the line that are working with vulnerable clients um, or for those that might be challenging to reach, how have you overcome some of those barriers 
uh, to recruit uh, uh, those clients in your QI effort. So perhaps we'll start with Tanya this time. Sure, thank you. So um, we informed the clients through an informal process, uh, which would mostly include the unit meetings that the Hope House holds um, every day, and also through word of mouth that we were working on a quality improvement process to gauge initial reactions of the clients surrounding this. Um, we spoke with as many of the staff as we could who worked directly with the clients and informed them of what we were doing and encouraged them to provide any contact info that was requested um, of us to anybody who requested it. So if any clients were asking uh, for more information that the staff didn't have, um, they could approach the EQUIP team uh, ourselves uh, through work, of course. Um, we, we just kind of wandered around and talked to a lot of people and explained anything to anybody who asked and encouraged everybody to follow up as much as they could and uh, speak amongst themselves as well about everything. Um, we, we reassured confidentiality at all times. We did have consents signed. Um, we followed up with any question that was asked. We also had no problem in um, seeking the clients out where they were physically located. Uh, we were very inclusive, non-judgmental, and used our motivational interviewing techniques. Thanks so much. Um, and Azad? Orientation. Um, for equipment, we, uh, you know, utilized quite a few methods. We we posted flyers in the buildings, uh, you know, and, and see if, if, you know, the 10 members are interested in joining uh, our QI team. So, uh, we received some responses and, and some of the 10 members uh, were interested in that. So we we did some, uh, some uh, initial interviewing and, uh, you know, wanted to know more. And we also wanted to make it clear what we expect uh, from, from our 10 members in the QI team. What are the time commitments and uh, what are the, you know, expectations? So we clearly defined those in, in those interviews. In addition to that, uh, you know, flyers, we received, you know, we asked for referrals from, from the direct service staff uh, and asked them, you know, if they think that there are 10 members who can be, uh, you know, who can be value, who can add value in our QI team. So uh, we received some referrals as well. Uh, the criteria are the thoughts that they have uh, in their mind regarding track records in, in different committee works or com, uh, community development activities we have it in our buildings. Um, you know, the commitment, if they demonstrated the commitment in doing those those work. So, because QI work, you know, you know we, 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 we had to meet twice a week, so uh, we need some sort of commitment uh, from the 10 members or the team members. So, the prior experience from our uh, staff members really, really, uh, you know, help in that case. We also check the records related to whether the tenants are in good standing regarding rent payments, arrears, whether they are in behavioral issues, uh, you know. So uh, we we check the records as well. We also checked, you know, when when we have because we have received quite a few. Uh, applicants so we also check you know their education course uh, uh, you know wellness recovery plan you know their work experience uh, so we also taken uh, those into consideration as well we also received uh, feedback from the managers you know who knew the 10 members for, uh, for for quite some time so these are the, some of the orientation strategies uh, we took after after we have selected our tenant members for the team you know through the selection of the process we we also clearly define that you know we are not receiving the services free and uh, we have defined that uh, an honorarium of $25 will be paid with two tokens and lunch and uh, so you know that they can they can participate uh, freely and uh, we value their time so these are some of the recruitment strategies we took uh, for orientation. We had a formal orientation session where we discussed about the background, 
you know of our QR work at Mainstay, um, how we've been came up, uh, you know, come up with this uh, stage that we are currently are at now. In addition to that, we have set some ground rules in terms of reference and in the initial meetings. Um, in addition to that, we we check one on one with ten members, you know, especially in the initial meetings, uh, so that are they on the right page? Are we, you know, is there anything that we can do in order for them to understand or contribute better? So these are the, some of the some of the strategies we took. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I like um, the point about making sure that expectations are clear and, and checking in with clients. Uh, we did another webinar uh, earlier this year on, on the same topic. Um, as you can imagine, uh, in the sector, it's, it's really popular and it's, it's helpful to hear the experiences of others. Um, but something that came out loud and clear at, at our first webinar on client and family member engagement was the importance of making sure that those expectations are clear, both from the client perspective, but also from the staff members that are, are collaborating with the individuals that are um, expressing their, their experiences to make sure that everyone's really all on board and um, uh, aware of you know the role that the client and family members um, might be playing in the improvement work. Great. Absolutely. Um, and uh, Brianna, if you have a few things to add. Yeah, so for our recruitment, a big part of it started off initially uh, working in-house with staff um, who have had involvement with clients and families. So a big part was trying to push in terms of education and helping staff understand what exactly we were looking for, uh, who we were hoping to recruit, and what the expectation of those individuals would be. So a big part of it was the education piece to start it off. Um, we worked directly right from staff first, and then from there we started branching out and connecting with some of our um, community partners who we work hand in hand with, who we often tend to kind of work with the same clients. Um, from that piece, then we then worked into making blast outs on our social media in terms of looking for interested individuals. Um, and then from there, we've been able to create a section on our CMAJ Lambton Kent website, which does give a description of you know, what the panel is, what the things that they do, um, the role description of what a panel member uh, would be, uh, and also a way to apply in terms of looking at being a part of the panel itself. So from that, once we were able to uh, find uh, enough uh, individuals, both families and clients, who are willing to participate and seemed appropriate for the roles, um, every single panel member receives an orientation. So we've been able to set up standard orientation times throughout the years to make sure that anybody coming through has the orientation completed. And in that time, we look at things um, like uh, completing them with a basic understanding of what quality improvement is and why it's important in our agency, um, giving them a brief understanding of what CMHA Lambton Kent is and what we do. Um, also just giving them a brief understanding of the different programs and the different functionality of our agency itself. Um, and then from there, we go into just specific things about what the panel is hoping to do um, and really just giving them a basic foundation knowledge to start so that way every single individual doesn't feel that they're coming in unaware of what uh, may be expected of them and what the environment that they're working in. Everyone signs a confidentiality agreement. Um, and we really try to keep everybody up to speed. Uh, in terms of working with vulnerable with clients, it, it was a big challenge and still continues to be in terms of recruitment, uh, making sure that we can get enough members consistently so that way the panel still uh, remains fully functional and will continue to do so for the years to come. Um, but really just connecting with staff and the individual um, service providers in our community and really getting the information out there that CMHA Lambton Kent is trying to do something that's collaborative and working with getting feedback directly from clients and families and trying to have this initiative throughout everything we do in the agency and not just specific to programs um, programs and that we provide them. Perfect, thanks so much. So um, our next set of questions is around challenging assumptions. Um, so what assumptions were challenged through discussions or uh, feedback from clients and family members? And how did the trajectory of your project or initiative change by engaging the people that you So we'll start with Azad. Okay. Um, it has been an interesting uh, journey, I should say, you know, uh, uh, hearing directly from the clients or the 10 members is really make makes a difference, you know, in doing a QI work or any work, I should say. Um, so, you know, when we're doing um, 
you know, this project, you know, the, the one of the reasons that we took this project because there was low participation in goal coaching. Um, so uh, when we're doing the root cause analysis, we, uh, you know, we were, we're thinking about what are the root causes for this problem. Um, so we, we, we thought and discussed, uh, you know, that there are quite a few issues that staff may not be able to motivate uh, our, our talent members to participate, participate in those, uh, you know, those programs related to uh, goal coaching. So, in fact, you know, because we have talent team members, you know, talent members who are in the QIT, because they thought that this is not uh, not, o not only about staff but also is their own you know their own challenges related to motivate themselves um, the impact of their mental health the self doubt self doubt the personal challenges were th 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 these were the factors it was much greater than uh, that you know motivation will come you know not only you know dedicating time you know if staff are dedicating time to work with 10 members that will that will not be sufficient it's it is very important to build a repo uh, so you have a good relationship so that you can utilize that and leverage that in you know when you are working with 10 members in the future in whatever work it is so uh, th these were the, some of the things that were challenged, uh, and and also we we it, it was really excited to to hear from them. Other pieces that ten members identified that it is very important to outreach outreach to ten members you know, when they are doing well because of the mental health issues. Sometimes they are not doing well, so it is important to outreach proactively so that when Whenever they are doing well, you can build a good relationship, which you can again utilize in in later time period when they are not doing well. Um, so, yeah, and uh, based on the discussion, you know, we have identified that there were role confusion, what the supportive housing workers' roles were. So, identifying those those issues. And then we started working on the change ideas re related to what we have learned. You know, uh, we worked on the education piece related to role uh, clear. Uh, you know, clear out the role confusion. We created a poster and we created another tool. So uh, yeah, these are some of some of the uh, key points of our discussion. But there were there were a lot more, I should say. Thanks, Doug. And Brianna? Yeah, so a lot of the assumptions that we kind of challenged uh, from the beginning uh, actually had to do not with the feedback that we got directly from clients and family members, but feedback that we had gotten back from staff, uh, just in terms of really getting the buy-in in terms of recruiting and looking for individuals who would be appropriate for the panel. So the feedback that we had gotten from clients and family members who were interested was very positive and had an understanding of understanding what the role would be um, and the expectation that we were looking from them. But it was really trying to make sure that we could relate that back to staff and really helping dispel some of the myths that uh, staff may have had in terms of thinking that, you know, well, what is the person going to think if they're not chosen? And how is it going to work out um, if a person would like to be involved? Um, but maybe, you know, doesn't fit the bill of what you guys are looking for. So really kind of working through some of those things, which we continue to do. Um, and over that time with being able to establish both of those groups on both sites, the trajectory has changed in terms of just the recruitment and who we're looking for. So conveniently enough, um, Sarnia panel has more family members on the panel than clients, does have a mix of both. And then Chatham site primarily has more clients uh, than family members. So really kind of now going forward, with this is taking a look through the development of our uh, recruitment matrix to make sure that we're having a balanced representation on both sites for everyone that we serve and the communities that we serve around us. So really kind of working on those things and, and still uh, making a lot of changes and challenging the assumptions as we go since we are just in the first year of operating the panel. Great, thank you. And Tanya? Hi, okay, so, um, Oh, sorry. One of the 
uh, assumptions that we had made and, and we based our problem statement off of was that um, clients found it frustrating or redundant to repeat their stories to various staff members amongst the programs here at CMHA Sault Ste. Marie. However, uh, that assumption was wrong. Um, the clients actually really liked to repeat their stories. They could see value in um, talking with the different staff members and explaining things and how they had progressed sometimes, you know, and how they had maybe met goals that they didn't even realize they had met. So they actually saw more value in repeating their stories than less. So we had to change our problem statement because initially we had based it on that assumption and uh, that assumption was proven to be wrong. Um, so let's see. Uh, oh yes, and it also helped them uh, in the repeating of their stories. Um, it also gave them the opportunity to see areas where they could use um, more work or maybe some goals that they may have given up on. Um, that's uh, probably about it, I would say, um, in terms of it just changed our problem statement and we, it became more um, based on what staff needed rather than what um, what staff needed to feel like they were serving their clients better rather than what the clients uh, wanted. So this question is for uh, Brianna. Are you using the uh, CK Consumer Initiative in your project? Yeah, so initially the the primary focus was starting up here at the Sarnia site only because that's where I my main office is located of and where I work from primarily. So we worked on getting up one site specifically first uh, since I was here in Sarnia. So we spent a lot of our time focusing on Sarnia and we did work um, a lot in terms of connecting with um, our own survivor initiative here, consumer survivor initiative here in Sarnia. Um, but we have been in, in connection with making sure that the uh, CK consumer initiative in Chatham for the main lead staff who I work in conjunction with has been trying to look at reach out, reaching out, especially for uh, clients and family members to make sure that they're aware of what we're doing and making sure that we can get that uh, word out. But we have been in, in connection, at least with here with Sarnia uh, and, and are working with Chatham Kent uh, only because Sarnia has been the main priority first. And now we're really looking at fully expanding our Chatham panel. Okay, thank you. And the next uh, set of questions is all about uh, co-designing improvement. Um, so the questions are, how did you apply what was learned through client and family member engagement to your improvement work? And were client and family member perspectives leveraged for a process or service redesign? Uh, we'll start with Brianna. Yeah, so the whole outcome in terms of us making, you know, the client and family advisory panel is really looking towards, you know, what are the outcomes that we can have collaboratively with clients and families. So everything that we do in terms of process, any type of new initiative that's coming through, everything is run through the panel um, to make sure that they can have input and as well just even have awareness and information about the things that we're doing or trying to do. So a lot of the things that we do have done, uh, or sorry, a lot of the things that we have done in terms of getting the feedback is every time that we do a program review, um, a panel member, a client or a family member is always present. So they're there with the team specifically that is completing that program review um, and getting feedback um, from what's been happening with that program, how things have been functioning, if there's anything specific that the client or family member could give forward in terms of information that they think would be beneficial or helpful. Um, other things that we do in terms of walkabouts, so we'll take either a client or family member from the panel to walk them through the agency in terms of just getting their, their experience in terms of how they're you know welcomed at reception, what they think um, interview rooms are like, the flow of the agency, all that kind of stuff. And a lot of the experiences that we had from program reviews and walkabouts have led to changes in environmental factors within the agency, whether that be better signage for bathrooms, whether that be reduction in stimuli in the weight rooms, um, and, and very specific program uh, things that may come up during those review times. But we have gotten a lot of really good feedback and really try to make sure that what the panel brings forward is something that they'll be able to see to make sure that we a have connection and buy-in from the panel members but also have that connection with staff that the feedback that we're getting from the clients and family members that we serve is really important uh beneficial and can work towards uh, that overall culture of quality improvement great 
Thanks, Antonia. Um, so one of the things that we did, obviously, was we had to change our problem and our aim statement. Um, so it was redesigned to reflect um, our needs better for this project in particular. Um, one of the challenges that we had with incorporating feedback was that, I mean, obviously clients, uh, they had tons of great suggestions but and uh, change ideas, but these were not realistic or attainable because um, most likely it would add work or time um, to our jobs. And what we're trying to do is streamline things here. So um, that was challenging to explain that to them in a way that they understood and didn't feel like they were being um, dismissed. Uh, but we we were able to do that. Um, one great thing that has come out of um, having the clients involved in our process so far is that we are discussing having an advisory committee or panel. Um, so, Brianne, I may be uh, touching base with you at some point to see, because it sounds like you guys have done a lot of work there, um, to see how that's going and w how you guys got to where you're at right now. Um, it definitely sounds challenging and complicated, but something that we're like really interested in because it it has really helped us. Great. And Azad? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Uh, sorry, I was having some technical issues uh, in in my you know computer, so so no I missed quite a few of of, of, of the session. So just can oh. you just remind me again <laughs> what what the discussion yeah. we are having. So uh, the questions are about the co-designing improvement. So how did you apply what was learned um, through the engagement work that you've done with your clients? Okay, so um, so a as I have mentioned earlier that 10 member identified, you know, that they had confusions around, uh, you know, the role of our supportive housing workers. Uh, so, in fact, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that we we have created a poster, uh, so which will define clearly what uh, what the roles of the poly housing workers are. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we we not only develop these materials because uh, we talk about co-design. So how we we gather their feedback. In fact, we whenever we are doing any PDSAs. Uh, you know, we are, we 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 gathered feedback, not limiting to the tenant members who are who are in our QI team, but also reaching out to tenant members outside of our QI team in different buildings, so that we hear from them, we hear their feedback and their their thoughts on different tools that uh, that we are working, and we gathered their feedback on the poster that we created, in, uh, and also the tool that we created, you know, for for uh, the meetings that we'll be having, supportive housing workers, when they meet with tenant members, uh, previously we didn't have anything that document those meetings. So we uh, we created a tool and we received their feedback, um, uh, and and uh, you know based on their feedback we modified uh, those materials. Uh, based on our learning, we also talked about the poster. Uh, we not only post posting the poster in our buildings, but also we are posting uh, those, you know, posting the poster in, in, in our calendar, in our calendar that are coming up for the uh, year 2019. So we'll, we are dedicating a center fold page to that poster, so which will work greater to uh, to increase the education or awareness piece regarding the goal confusion uh, related to, uh, you know, you know what the work that the public housing workers are doing. Um, so yeah, so in 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 a nutshell, this is this is how we utilize our co-design method. And we we, we previously talked about uh, utilizing EBD. So we we heard from ten members in different focus group discussions utilizing the EBD tool uh, and surveys. So uh, whatever we learned, we apply those and we can go back to our ten members to see if. We have uh, understood correctly, and we we take like, take corrective measures to to improve those even further. Great, thanks. It's nice to uh, to hear about um, you know you you ask your tenants to uh, read that poster that you've you've 
uh, created, and I know that you had staff feedback on it first, and then you opened it up to, to tenants. Um, do you remember, uh, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but do you remember any specific feedback that came out from tenants on that on that poster and how you incorporated it in? One of the feedback that I can think of right now is, uh, you know, the picture that we used. One of the one of uh, we we used a picture where there were, you know, there was there was a hand, you know, and holding uh, holding the house. You know, because we are trying to trying to show that we are talking about housing stability. So we we heard from them that, well, uh, uh, it, it it also you know I, we under, they said that we understand that uh, we are talking about caring, but again, it also said so that you are holding our house in your hand. So it it also not 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 not, not may may not be you know understood clearly enough. So you know we should. We should not put, uh, you know, any pictures related to that kind of a thing, but rather you can put picture of your of your building, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so that it 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 it's it's more of an uh, you know attachment related to our own properties. So right. yeah, that I can think of right now. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thanks. Yeah, it's just nice to hear some of those uh, really specific examples. Um, so we'll keep moving um, on to the next set of questions or question, I guess. And it's all about challenges. So were there any challenges you faced in getting or incorporating feedback from clients and family members um, that you had collaborated or engaged with? We'll start with Tanya. Hi, yeah, I think I um, already answered that question to some degree, um, just in terms of like being able to implement some of the suggestions and changes that they had brought forward, um, just in terms of not being realistic uh, fiscally, um, not really being attainable. Um, due to work and time commitments already there. So um, we haven't really been able to, like our project is not completed yet. So right now we are still in the design process and we're not able to implement anything at this point because we're still working on a, a an actual change idea. So I can't really um, speak too much to that. So that's about all I have for that. Okay, thanks. Um, and Azad, any challenges? Um, well, I should say, you know, when we started this work, we knew that QI work is a little different from a, any other work. You know, you need to have uh, some sort of basic understanding of, of the QI work. So even though, if, you know, you are a town member, so, uh, but you need, in order to contribute greatly, is, is, is it is very important that, you know, we have a basic understanding. So. Uh, in, in the initial meetings, I should say it, it was a little challenging to keep the topics, you know, <laughs> you know, within within the topic, keep the discussion within the, within the topic, because uh, you know we were discussing uh, you know a bunch of issues that may, may not be related to the topic that we or the issues that we were trying to find out. So uh, we we oftentimes had to you know bring things uh, to the topic. In addition to that, uh, we had some uh, tenant turnovers. So whenever new tenant members came in, uh, we again need to orient and you know the previous pieces that were done. So we need to do those pieces again. So again, in the initial meetings, we had some 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 sort of challenges uh, to to getting up to speed and and uh, you know when tenant members started to contribute again. So you know. Yeah, so in, th those were the initial challenges. The other challenge, uh, you know, I feel is is mo much greater is the sustainability of ten members. Uh, oftentimes, we see that ten members they are interested and uh, they want to contribute, but again, you know, there are other commitments and also mental health issues. You know, when whenever they are not doing well, um, they need to go back or they. You know, they just cannot continue their commitment uh, to the team that they have committed. So we have lost, uh, you know, our t t t team members, one of our, one or two our team members who, who started off very well, but again, you know, couldn't continue uh, because of various reasons. So, yeah, there, these are some of the challenges that we face. Great, thank you, and Brianna. 
Yeah, so a couple of the challenges that we've kind of initially came up with, like I had mentioned before, recruitment's going to be our ongoing struggle in terms of making sure that we have enough um, clients and family members to have on the panel to make it sustainable. But a big piece was getting um, staff uh, aware of having clients and family members present at every single program with you, which was difficult at first. Change is hard, um, but understanding and kind of working through some of the concerns of, you know, are we allowed to talk openly about how a program may be functioning with, you know, a client or family member present, and really being able to kind of work on that education piece, understanding that the people who that we've selected and interviewed and screened for these positions do have specific um, characteristics and skills. And, and they're at a place in their recovery or in terms of their family members' recovery that they're willing and able to participate and kind of separate their own experiences from what may be happening currently. Um, so a piece of that was just getting st uh, staff really on board to having that involvement and that transparency between clients and family members. Um, and then another piece now that we're really looking at is gathering that feedback from both panel members as well as staff in terms of having a better understanding, you know, what um, is the feedback from having staff um, have clients and family members at their program reviews from the panel's perspective, you know, do they feel that they're making an impact, um, all that kind of good stuff. So we're really just working on gathering that feedback and being able to take some of that information back to the panel as well as being able to take a look at is there anything that we need to change um, from an agency's perspective in terms of continuing the education for staff and, and those things going forward. Mm -hmm. Great, and uh, that. The recruitment challenges are something that we hear about quite often, and so um, I think that that's pretty common throughout the sector. Um, great. So that's I uh, thank you all for your your honesty and openness uh, for that that question. I know sometimes it's difficult to talk about our challenges, but it's really important for for others to learn from. Uh, so our final question is about advice for others. So um, what would you have wanted to know when you first started to engage with clients and our families in improvement work? Um, and if there's anything that you would do differently next time uh, before you set out on this journey, what would it be? Uh, we'll start with Azad. Okay, so uh, the reason that we engaged our panel members in the QI team is we want to know better. You know, what, you know, we have been doing QI work, we, we are working with the direct service staff, but again, that was not, that was not enough. So we wanted to know you know, from their perspective, from our current members' perspective, how we can we can do things better. What are the areas that we need to need to work on? Uh, you know, what are what, you know for this specific project? What's the problem? What what uh, what what what's the issue that you know they are contributing in not engaging in in this in this program? So these are the things that you know you know, in a in a nutshell that we were trying to achieve or trying to learn. Um, so if I talk about what would we do differently next time, uh, from our learning, uh, I'd say recruit more talent members than we need uh, next time. Uh, you know, we, we have seen that, I, th I talked about the sustainability issue. So uh, let's say we, we identified that we want to have uh, three talent members. Uh, in our QI team, so maybe next time what we will do, we will recruit either five or six ten members. So uh, we know that the sustainability might be challenging, so we we still can have some ten members uh, representing uh, and contributing in the QI team. Previously, we were doing you know in terms of frequencies of meetings, uh, we were meeting uh, by week by monthly, and we were having a two hour meeting. So next time, you know, based on our learning and experiences, we thought that it would be beneficial if we have longer meetings uh, and lower in frequencies. So we can solve more problems in one meeting uh, that that uh, might be more of a value for us. Because we, we have seen that uh, discussions take a, a lot of time. So a two hour meeting is, is not always su sufficient enough. So maybe next time what we will do is we'll have either a four or five hour meetings uh, and uh, you know we can achieve more in, in one meeting. We can also uh, do in between brainstorming, you know, not only we, we since we have talent team members in, in our team, but there are some pieces of work that the staff need to do. 
So maybe in between, staff team members can meet and prepare uh, some some uh, some materials or some discussion topics, or draft some some materials so that the, when we meet uh, as a as a total team, that that we can utilize their experience, experience and expertise to uh, to focus on the things that we need more from them rather than on operational pieces that staff can do by themselves. Uh, we also found that uh, it is important not only to hear from 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 the tenants, you know, who are our QIT members, uh, but also you know to delegating some work to them. Uh, we we found that it is sometimes boring that only they are uh, talking. So we heard from them that it, it will add it will add value if they can contribute in in doing some of the work, like you know some of our, our QIT members said that maybe taking minutes or maybe you know, doing some work in the computer, they, they will be they will be more interested in doing that as well. So and which will also again uh, you know work as a more empowerment piece. So they will be more involved and more empowered. So yeah, so this these are the, some of the things that we learned and maybe maybe help us in the future meetings if we if we uh, adopt these things. Great, thank you. And Tanya? Tanya, I think you're on mute. Hi, sorry about that. No problem, here we go. Okay, um, so one of the things that uh, we took away from this was to involve clients from the beginning of the process in terms of a change project. So possibly having clients sit in on QI projects um, pretty much going forward is something that we've been considering. Um, another thing is to not ever make assumptions because you know we, we made a large assumption that was completely wrong. So having that conversation with them ahead of time would have been much more helpful. Um, Another thing is to be prepared for anything. When you give clients the floor to talk about things that are happening within our organization, um, they ended up having lots of very valuable questions and suggestions about all sorts of things. So, um, so it would probably be beneficial to have one contact person um, per project to follow up with the clients and all of their questions and suggestions because uh, having too many people involved uh, became very confusing and nobody was sure who was following up with things. So um, that, that's kind of two answers there, sorry, but be prepared for anything and questions about everything and then have one contact assigned to contact the clients uh, directly. So that would be what I would suggest. Great, thank you. And Brianna? I think the biggest thing for us here at CMHA Lambton Kent, um, our biggest takeaway, which would have been super beneficial looking back now if we could have one piece, was using the recruitment matrix to really help the staff buy in and also kind of help us focus on who exactly we were looking for and really taking a look at the skill sets and characteristics of the individuals we were hoping to have on the panel or even have our, in our advisor members in terms of specific things, whether it be representation from the Indigenous communities around us or specific traits in terms of past involvement with volunteer experience or past involvement with quality projects or just specific information that they may have from their own professional or volunteer um, experiences. So really having that tool, I think, going forward if at the beginning would have been more helpful uh, for the recruitment for buy-in and really being able to help us streamline um, what we were looking for, who we were looking for, and the mix um, for each site, both Chatham and Sarnia. Great. All right. So that brings us to the end of our, our great panel discussion. And again, I just want to thank all of the, the panelists that have shared your insights uh, and tips and uh, the actions and strategies that you've taken. Um, I know that, uh, you know, you were identified by, by your coaches and, and the EQIP team as real champions for this work. So I thank you very much for your time and uh, willingness to share. 
So to end things off, I know we're a little bit over time, but I'll just give you um, some additional resources and ways to connect with the EQIP team. Um, this slide uh, really is a nice overview of some of the EQIP related resources on client and family member engagement. I'll draw your attention to the second, uh, sorry, the first point. Uh, that is uh, the webinar that I had mentioned previously that we've done on this topic or kind of part one of this of this uh, topic of engagement uh, was done in April by two of our first cohort teams. Um, and they uh, provided some insight into some of the questions you heard about today, uh, but also some others. Uh, they also had clients on the line as well for that webinar. So it was interesting to hear from that perspective. So I encourage you to watch that webinar. If, if this one uh, really was helpful to you, I'm sure that one will be as well. Um, there are other resources, another webinar on the experience-based design uh, uh, that uh, Tanya talked a lot about today, um, as well as Azad. So if you want to learn more about that approach, uh, please feel free to watch that webinar and learn about EBD. Um, and then there's some, uh, uh, our newsletter that just came out is uh, in November uh, was all about client and family member engagement. And there's some nice stories in there for you to learn about as well. Um, additional resources and conversations on our community of practice, the links are on this slide as well. So I don't see any questions coming in, but if you do, please please type them in. Uh, we did want to end off with a question uh, for you uh, to reflect on what you heard about today. Uh, and that's based on what you learned about today. Let us know about one strategy or action that you're looking for, forward to testing to enhance the client and family member engagement through your improvement work at your own organization. So I'll just give you a minute to think about that. Uh, and if you can type in the answer to that question or any other questions you have for the panelists, uh, please feel free. We do have one question coming in. Um, do you have uh, information that can be shared regarding what quali qualities or circumstances of family members that are a good fit versus those that might inhibit good and meaningful participation by family members? Wondering if any of our panelists have an uh, answer to that one. I don't know. I don't think of any any resources that we can have, but you know, it's okay. the, it's the learning, you know, for us through the Equip project. You know, you know what what are the ways, and also some of the webinars that I have been participating, you know, in, mm -hmm. in the in the Equip and the HQO. So those really helped. Yeah. Can you repeat the question, please, Jenna? It was about, um, do you have information that can be shared regarding what qualities or circumstances of family members that are a good fit versus those that might inhibit good and meaningful uh, participation? Hmm. I mean, personally, I, I would say people that are um, invested in their family members' health. Uh, in, rather than people that are maybe there to vent or are angry, uh, that uh, that energy kind of takes away from the um, the product the productivity right of the group. So um, you're looking for the. I mean, for myself, I'm just saying family members that you know are good advocates for their their client their family who is a client of ours. Not sure, Brianna, you have anything to share um, regarding the, the family members that you engaged with? Yeah, just to kind of echo what Tanya was saying is that a big part of it was having the understanding that we work with clients and family members who go through a lot of difficult things every single day. So having yeah. an awareness of that, but also being aware that the work that we're trying to do is not specifically on, you know, based on an individual family member's experience, but kind of the overall piece and taking a kind of further step back in terms of what we provide, how it works, and being able to change experiences for, you know, family members and clients in general. So really kind of having that delicate approach and understanding and really working through the screening process of meeting with those, with those clients and, and family members through the interview and having that conversation and really having an idea of where that person is coming from. And again, making sure that they're at the point um, 
either in their own or their family member's recovery or their family member's involvement or their own involvement with the mental health system, that they're at the point where they can separate their own experiences from what um, we're kind of looking for them. So again, it's just, it, for us, it was very much um, a person by person basis and having that understanding of what we were looking for was having people that could provide that feedback, but also being aware that everyone's gonna come with their own um, situation to the table and making sure that there was just that ability to have that clear understanding that it wasn't a, um, you know, it wasn't a support group or that piece, um, but really being able to, what can we do to improve the services and our agency in general for the people who um, access it. Right, and some of the answers that are coming in um, on kind of the, those actions or strategies that you're looking forward to trying at your own agency, um, we're hearing that people are excited and uh, looking forward to trying to establish a client and family member advisory committee. Um, uh, folks are interested in learning about and exploring ways to engage uh, clients in person or by survey. Uh, a lot of interest in the experience-based co-design tools um, as well as revisiting the frequency and length of meetings um, that in, involve uh, clients and family members. So, um, so that's great. That's that's good feedback for us, and uh, I hope that uh, you're able to take some of what you learned today and and bring it back to your home agencies. I know that we're a bit over time, so I'll just quickly go through um, these additional resources for you, and you can expect an email in your inbox uh, today with with all of this information in it. So if you don't catch it all, not to worry, you'll get a a follow-up communication from us. Uh, the first is our community of practice, which is our online portal of resources and discussions for those particularly working in community mental health and addiction. So I encourage you to become a member and sign up so that you can get access to those resources. In December, we're having a discussion on the value of the model for improvement uh, and uh, kind of trusting the QI process um, from beginning to end uh, to have really good and meaningful improvement work. And so the question that we're talking about our, on our community of practice this month is all about what was the most useful quality improvement tool that you've used in the past um, and how has it helped you in your QI work, kind of explaining why you like that tool and, and what it helps you do. So I encourage you to uh, log on and, and contribute to that conversation. We do take the feedback that we get in those conversations and we're starting to compile that information to make some um, tip sheets and checklists for the sector to use as they're working on QI work. Uh, this slide is really all about our upcoming webinars. Um, so much like today, we're um, hosting a series uh, between now and the end of March. Uh, so I encourage you to click on those links and register if you're interested. Uh, to learn more about what you can expect for each webinar, uh, please click on the registration link and there's a bit of a description there for each of the, each of the sessions that we're hosting. There's also a quick QI webinar series that we've recently launched online through our YouTube channel. So if you need a refresher on the model for improvement and any or all of the tools that the Equip team um, works with and promotes, uh, we have a nice uh, webinar um, a kind of playlist on our YouTube channel that can provide you that refresher on each tool um, and uh, approach that we use uh, in the QI work that we do. These are the past webinars, um, so I encourage you to click on those links if there's any um, topic there that's of interest to you. You can see that um, the uh, other client and family member engagement webinar link is on there as, as well, so you can uh, learn more about this topic through that webinar. I also encourage you to stay uh, informed with Equip and all of our offerings for the sector by joining our newsletter if you're not a part of that already. Again, this link will be sent to you following um, uh, this webinar in that uh, follow-up email. Uh, and our wonderful panelists today um, have uh, kindly agreed that uh, uh, we can share their, their contact information. So if you have any specific questions for them after today, please feel free to reach out. Um, they're incredibly knowledgeable and, and kind souls, and I'm sure they will uh, be able to, to help you um, uh, with your clients and family member engagement. Uh, and this is the contact information um, for the EQIP team. Uh, so if you uh, need anything in terms of uh, questions about the EQIP initiative as a whole, please feel free to reach out to myself, Debbie, or Michael. We're always uh, available and happy to help. And uh, the final um, ask that we have for you is uh, through your, your email that you'll receive today. We do like to evaluate our webinars so that we can make sure that these are meaningful uh, and engaging for you. So please uh, have a look at that. And um, 
uh, provide us some feedback uh, to help us improve uh, as a project. It doesn't take very long. It's only about three questions long. Um, so with that, I just, again, really like to thank you uh, to the panel today. I learned a lot from you. I'm sure everybody on the line did as well. Um, this event was brought to you by a lot of uh, feedback and, and support from the sector to shape our webinar series, as well as our, we have a committee dedicated uh, to shaping our webinars and our communications efforts. So thank you to, to those folks as well for helping um, create some of the questions and content that you've heard about today. Um, and with that, uh, thank you so much for joining everyone and have a great afternoon.